were a Golang developer in the fall of 2019, you probably know of me. I was a Noogler at the time, and I had been uh, working on the Istio project for about a year. There was a dependency library I needed to update for a, a fix I was pushing out. And the owner of the library was a Googler, so he was happy to give me access, ownership to the repo, and I went ahead and pushed out version 1.0.4 of the PFLAGS library. Yes, that PFLAGS library. The uh, one, let's see, see if we can zoom here. What have we got here? 213,183 dependents on GitHub. Uh, so I pushed out my change, and uh, as luck would have it, it contained a bug, but that's okay, because I followed best practices, and my push was a pre-release on GitHub, that beautiful little checkbox that you can do when you launch something. Little did I know, however, that the Go mod uh, system that pulls in dependencies for builds doesn't know anything about GitHub's checkbox. And so, on September 17th, 2019, every automated Go build on the internet uh, went ahead and pulled in my broken change and broke itself, failed to build. Now, let's, let's take a look at what projects I broke. Uh, this is the CNCF project velocity graph, so up and to the right is where we want to be looking right now. Uh, we've got Kubernetes, yeah, they use PFLAGs. Open telemetry, yep, Cilium, mm-hmm. Argo, yes, Istio, Meshery, Knative, gRPC, Nats, yes, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I think the only project that I'm certain does not use PFLAGs that's up here right now is Envoy, and that's because it's written in C and C++, so not really available to them. So these are the projects that I broke, uh, and of course, I didn't know that I broke them because, like a boss, I pushed my changes, published my release, and went home for the night. You can imagine how I felt the next morning when I got into work to hundreds and hundreds of these. Uh, owners of the various projects I had broken, very kindly requesting that I uh, improve my release processes and maybe fix their change. Well, I'm not one to be deterred. I immediately opened up uh, VS Code, got to work, fixed the problem, pushed it up, and I'm smart. I don't want a public record of my failures on the internet, so I'm gonna push it out as V104 again. Just cover that right up. No one needs to know that I broke the internet. So that caused this issue, uh, which no one had ever seen before. There was a new checksum system that had been rolled out to Golang two weeks prior. I was the first person in the world to break it, uh, which was pretty exciting. And everyone got this terrifying security error uh, saying that someone was doing fishy with their dependencies. Well, that, that someone was me. What went wrong in this story? Was it the lack of automated testing so that I had confidence that I was not breaking the internet when I published my release? I mean, I would have loved that. That would be great. By the way, PFLAGS is still that bad. So if you're interested in getting started in open source and you like writing tests, uh, you can help us out there. Was it the GitHub Semver mismatch? The fact that GitHub called it a pre-release and Golang didn't? That's a problem that still exists today. By the way, you new software engineers, don't trust the checkbox. Uh, but I really don't think that's ultimately the cause. It also pointed out that all of those projects that I broke had not frozen their dependencies. They were pulling in fresh versions of their dependencies on every automated build. Uh, but that was the standard practice in the Golang ecosystem in 2019. Uh, I, I can say that I am partly responsible for the fact that everyone has a package lock these days in their Go project. Uh, not responsible in the way that I would like, but responsible nonetheless. I think that what really happened, the true root cause here that we need to talk about, was that there was not an automated, structured way for me to get my code safely from source to production or release in this case. There should, I should not have been going into the UI and checking boxes saying, sure, ship it, and I feel like naming it this today, and I feel like making it a pre-release today. Like This should have just been a pipeline that picked things up and pushed them out and made them available. So today, in the next 25 minutes, my colleague Christian and I are going to show you how if you're operating Istio, you can build a pipeline with ambient mode and Argo CD that will keep you from breaking yourself the way that I broke the internet. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Mitch Connors. I'm a senior principal engineer at Aviatrix. I'm also a product manager there where I own container networking and platform engineering. I've been on the Istio project for five years now where I'm UX lead and on the TOC. And this year I'm serving as a uh, CNCF ambassador, which has been a lot of fun. Christian, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, my name is Christian Hernandez. I am uh, the head of community over at Acuity. 
And uh, I'm an uh, Argo Project member. I'm also part of the marketing uh, SIG at the Argo Project, um, which uh, takes care of things like putting on ArgoCon, which is going on on the other side of uh, this building here. I'm also a maintainer of Open GitOps, and I'm a guitar player and a wine enthusiast, so like, if you guys are tired of talking about tech and you want to talk about this other stuff, you, we can have a hallway track there um, as well. So um, I think also um, this isn't just like a story, a use case. We actually built something you can use, right? So um, you can go ahead and uh, scan the QR code. You can use it as a reference architecture. And I believe you're trying to get it into the Istio. It is. Uh, this will actually point you to the Istio repository, thankfully, to a few of you who approved my pull request Friday night way too late. Uh, this is our reference architecture that we're going to be showing off today. You can pull it down from Istio and make use of it yourselves, and you can follow along right now in the code that we're going to be using. I'll give you a warning. I went a little bit QR code crazy. My kids taught me how to use them this week. Uh, so keep your cameras and phones ready. All right, where are we going? Uh, Christian is going to share with us a little bit about how GitOps and Argo CD and platform engineering are all related concepts and how they matter for the Istio project. Uh, then we're going to talk about what has changed in ambient mode about upgrading Istio. Why is it easier to operate Istio in ambient mode than sidecar mode? We're going to talk about things that you should consider when planning your Istio upgrades. And then we're going to bring it all together with a series of three demos on a live site on the internet. So let's get started. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about the GitOps principles. Now, I can do like a whole talk, I can do a whole conference on GitOps principles and what they are in deep meaning, but I'm gonna go um, kind of high level here and then we can do a hallway track if you want me to get deeper on any one of these things. But um, kind of the story behind GitOps and the GitOps principles, uh, if you wanna learn more, opengitops.dev is a lot of our practitioners at that time, a few years ago, uh, members from the, uh, uh, the Argo community, members from the Flux community, people from like Red Hat, AWS, um, all these interested parties got together and tried to define what GitOps is, right? And so at that time, um, you know, Kubernetes was kind of just blowing up and people were trying to operationalizing um, Kubernetes. So we came up with some of these principles of what it means to be GitOps, right? And so the first principle is it needs to be declaratives, right? So a system managed by GitOps needs to have its desired state expressed declaratively. All right, so not, as you know, we have uh, a declarative infrastructure that is Kubernetes. People were still doing things imperatively. We, we said, no, you have to leverage um, the declarative nature of Kubernetes, which kind of brings on to the next um, principle, which is it needs to be version and immutable, meaning the desired state is stored in a way that enforces immutability, versioning, and retains a complete history, right? This is where the Git in GitOps comes from, right? Because that's kind of what the Git gives you there as well. Other things are, are fine to use as well, like S3 and things like that. But as long as it's um, a version and immutable, you're following the principles. So now number three, pulled automatically. Uh, this I do want to get a little bit deeper, maybe an inch and a half, maybe not uh, an inch deep. But um, pulled versus pull, you're, 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 you're probably thinking, does it matter how I apply the manifest, either in a pull or pull match? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that the, the declarations themselves, right, the, the manifests, right, or i.e. the YAML, needs to be pulled into the system. So the only reason for that is, and we're, we're, we're sticklers on that, is to differentiate it from like an event-based type of workflow or for like a web hooks, right? So not to say that you're not gonna be using web hooks in your GitOps workflow, you absolutely are. It's just using solely web hooks isn't GitOps because it needs to be, number four, continuously reconciled. Software agents, right, the two most popular is Argo City and Flux, um, are, continuously observe the system and attempt to apply the manifest, right? So reconcile, you know, the running state and the desired state. So again, I can go on and on about GitOps, opengitops.dev, join a community meeting um, there, pull me in the hallway track, I can do that as well. So I think um, some of the roles we're gonna talk about like in, in, this, in this talk here is the role of the platform engineer, um, you know, provides the actual infrastructure provides the system, and their customer is the actual application developer, right? The engineer, right? The internal engineer is their customer. And they don't necessarily want to be geniuses in platform infrastructure. They don't necessarily care. Um, a lot of engineers don't. And really, they just want to write their code, consume templates, and basically utilize the platform. Um, and so the platform engineer 
really all they care about in their world is that they want to patch vulnerabilities, they want to keep the system up and running, they want the lights on, um, they want to upgrade without disturbing any of the engineers. Um, that's their primary job, that's their primary goal. The app developer doesn't want to learn service mesh. So it's, it's, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, we, when service mesh first came out, Istio first came out, it was this big thing, and um, everyone thought developers were gonna love it. It's actually more for the platform engineers, right? So they don't wanna learn service mesh, but what they wanna do is they want to be able to leverage service mesh. They wanna be able to consume all the things that service mesh provides. They don't necessarily wanna manage it. So, um, which kind of leads me to the Ar Argo project. I'm not going to go too deeply into this, just know that the Argo project is a suite of tools that operationalizes Kubernetes, right? There's things like workflows, um, events, CD rollouts. Um, in the Istio world, if you're in the Istio world and you're working with platform engineers, you'll hear a lot about Argo CD and Argo rollouts. This is kind of like the, the where, where it plays in to there. Um, but that's what the Argo project aimed to do when it was first created, is to operationalize Kubernetes in a GitOps way. So, um, so Argo CD really tailors to both platform engineers and developers, right? It has a, a feature-rich UI, it has the health and monitoring and the uh, multi-cluster, multi-tenant capabilities that platform engineers want, advanced deployment patterns um, and extensibility and integration that developers want, uh, be able to, single, to see in a single UI for both platform engineers and developers um, was the end goal for Argo CD and it tailors to both, um, to both teams. So. Um, I think I'll hand it back to Mitch to talk about Ambient Mesh. Yeah, so you all heard from John this morning about Ambient Mesh and its architecture. I'm not gonna de dive deep into that. If you missed it, check out the video, it's a great talk. I do wanna talk about what our objectives were in building Ambient, they were threefold. We wanted to make onboarding easier, we wanted to make operations easier, and we wanted to make resource utilization on your cluster easier. Uh, for this talk, we're only going to be talking about that middle goal, reducing operational friction. But that's not all there is to Ambient. I want to make sure that that's clear before we get started. Uh, we've had sidecar mode in Istio for quite some time now, and a lot of us have gotten pretty accustomed to it. And a lot of what we're showing off today works in sidecar mode. For instance, both support multiple versions of the control plane in the cluster. We call that a canary upgrade for your, control, or for your Istio version, and you can do that in sidecar mode. You control which data planes are talking to which version of the control plane with tags and revisions. We're gonna dig into those quite a bit in the, in this de in the next couple of demos. Uh, but I've got their support as sort of in sidecar mode. They work in sidecar mode, but only at pod startup time. You start a pod, it gets the version its tag points to. You later change what that tag points to, the pod doesn't care. So you may think that you've upgraded all of Istio in sidecar mode, you've applied all of your Helm charts and everything else, only to find out that that CVE that you're urgently trying to patch is still actively being exploited because none of your Envoy proxies have upgraded. You need to follow a final step, which is to restart all of those pods to allow them to be re-injected. That's completely non-declarative. We call that an imperative action, and it makes Istio in sidecar mode rather difficult to operate uh, in a CI-CD or in a GitOps sort of scenario. As a matter of fact, we heard earlier this morning from the, the, uh, the first talk, I, I lost the name of their company, DevRev. Uh, they talked about how they built something that would automatically detect oh, the sidecars are at this version and I see a control plane at this version, so I'm gonna nuke the sidecars one at a time until they all get restarted. Uh, that's a, a great solution to the problem. I, that's a, a solution I've implemented in production in the past. I'd really love for nobody else to ever have to implement that solution again. Uh, what we need to do is implement declarative upgrades for the projects, and I think Ambient is going to give us that. How does Ambient give us that? Well, we've divided, as we mentioned, our data plane into two components, our layer four or Z tunnel component and our layer seven component, which we call the waypoints. It's still implemented by Envoy. You all know and love Envoy already, I'm sure. So you're familiar with the fact uh, that, oh, Envoy isn't written in Go. Sorry, I've got that slide wrong. It's written in C++. It's extremely complex because it's so powerful. You can do WebAssembly running in your Envoy. You can do a million different load balancing profiles in your Envoy. You can do just about anything. I've seen people literally embed their app into Envoy. So it's not actually a proxy. It's just running their application server in process. Uh, that means that stability of Envoy is quite low. 
There's a lot to keep moving. There's a lot of features being added all the time. And if you've watched the CVEs out of the Envoy project, you know that they tend to be related to layer seven functionality. Layer four has always been much simpler. There's just not a lot going on at layer four. And so what the Istio project has done is moved our layer four processing into a purpose-built binary, built in Rust, that doesn't do much. It's pretty simple, and that means it's extremely stable. For instance, we're going to look real quickly at the HTTP rapid reset bug that you all probably have been having to deal with in production for the last, you know, four months. Uh, in Envoy, we got that patched as the zero day was announced and pushed out to the community. Way to go release managers for Istio. In the Z tunnel, it was patched, I think, in May. Uh, before anyone even knew that it was a real vulnerability, it just looked like a bug in the code and it got patched and went away. That's what you can expect from your Z-Tunnel. And therefore, the Z-Tunnel is going to be run once per cluster. We're going to say you get one version of your layer four data plane, and you get one instance of it per node. It's that stable. It's that efficient. You can trust it. Envoys, you shouldn't trust. You're going to need to run a few versions concurrently. When you go to upgrade them, you're going to need to take baby steps in that upgrade. Upgrade this thing and see what happens, and then upgrade that thing and see what happens. With the Z-Tunnel, we expect to provide the kind of stability that says, you can just say cluster was on A, now it's on B, done, I can go home like I did on Friday, and hopefully it goes better for you than it did for me. Uh, there's a few other things, though, that we're operating here. Just like in sidecar mode, you can run many control planes or IstioDs per cluster. You can have many tags and revisions referring to those control planes. But the CNI and Z-Tunnel are going to be only once per cluster. Let's take a look. If you've opened that GitHub link, you've probably seen a whole lot of YAML. Uh, so this is like your roadmap to the YAML. If it's a little bit overwhelming, I apologize. But there's only a few things you really need to pay attention to. One, meta-application.yaml. This is our bootstrap file. It's the only thing you need to cube cuddle apply once you have an Argo instance up. Everything else gets pulled in automatically through GitOps. So there's your bootstrap. And we have two folders that we're bootstrapping primarily. We have our application folder. This is just our sample book info app. Our app dev owns this space. He's running three different gateways. Two of them are waypoints that we just talked about for layer seven. One of them's an ingress gateway that works pretty much the same way as it does in sidecar mode. And then we've got our Istio folder, which is owned by our platform engineer. And it's a little bit more complicated. She's got to manage CNI, Z-Tunnel, uh, the set of control planes that we run, which is going to be more than one, as well as all of our tags and revisions, and then some extra stuff in case you want to show off your demo. I'm not going to show off that bit today. Let's talk a little bit about how tags and revisions work. We've been sort of flirting with this concept, and I know that not everyone has made use of them even in sidecar mode yet. A revision is just a name for a control plane. You install control plane 1181, it will need a revision name. And that name should not change ever. And you should not reuse that name ever. That is that control plane's name. It is stable and immutable. Uh, and you can actually use that in this Istio IO rev label on your objects. That's not what we're going to demo, uh, because it refers to a specific version. And that's not actually how we want our app devs to interact. Tags, however, are like the opposite. They're completely mutable. They're sim links to your, uh, your revisions. And so in this case, we're using the stable tag. And when we want to upgrade this gateway, we're going to go and update the stable tag and say it was 117, now it's 118, and everything just upgrades. All right? Everybody with me there? OK. So this is our layout right now. All three gateways are either explicitly using the stable tag or they're not using any tag, in which case they get default, which happens to be pointed to the same as stable, is DOD 118.3. Uh, we also have a rapid tag available, but nobody's making use of it in 119.1. Now, these versions, you probably know, should not be in your production right now because of that rapid reset bug. So let's get to our first demo. Uh, we want to go ahead and fix that rapid reset problem. I'm sure you're familiar with this vulnerability. Oh, and by the way, I told you this would be live on the internet. Here is the QR code link to take you to uh, my little Locus site. This is a load generator that's actively running against our application. So if that line, if the red line climbs and the green line falls, you all will know that I have done something wrong. And you'll know it probably before I do. All right, here's Locus right now. Uh, we're looking pretty good. Notice I'm still on Pacific time, so everything looks a little off here. But uh, everything's green. 
And we're going to go into Argo so that I show you the particular version of that gateway. We'll just pick one of them. We don't need to see all of them. Our book info gateway is running Istio proxy version. I know this is pretty small here, but you, if you can't see it in the back, it's 1.18.3. That's our vulnerable version. Here's our pull request for patching that. Oh, sorry, we have a two-step two process in the person of our platform engineer. First is we need to deploy the patched control planes. Then we need to make use of the patched control planes. You don't want to do that at the same time. Control planes will spin up looking for something that doesn't exist. So step one, put 118.5 and 119.3 out there. Let's go ahead and merge that. So when uh, demo gods, we go. Yep. This is live. <laughs> Let's come back here, and we should see... Oh, man, it's already there. That's how fast this thing is. 118.5 and 119.3 are spinning up. They're going to turn green in just a second. In the meantime, we will go ahead and get to our second pull request. And uh, let's take a look at what the, that change is. Now we're taking the, our tags file. Our default tag was pointing at 18.3. Our stable tag was 18.3. Our rapid tag was 19.1. And we're just updating those to those versions of the control plane that we just deployed. This little shim here at the bottom is going away. You don't need to worry about it after 120 releases. It's just to patch a bug in 118 and 119. All right, and let's go check out that gateway again. Oh, look at that. It's already spinning up the new version. Now it's tearing down the old version. We can open up this new version. And uh, scroll down to our image tag, which is way down here. Not that far down here. 118.5. We've been patched. Check Locus to see how we're doing. Uh, looks like we got a little bit of a throughput hiccup here. Remember that this is still an alpha product. Ambient should not be in your production cluster. Please don't put it there. I don't want to get that ticket on GitHub. Uh, no failures, though. It's just a little slow. Yep. So that'll <laughs> pick back up as those, uh, those proxies warm up. And that's our first demo. All right, so what we just did was take those, those uh, three proxies and upgrade them. We spun up the new versions of the control plane, and then we changed what the tags were pointing to. Uh, and we did all of that in the person of our platform engineer. What was our app dev up to at the time? We don't really care. Yeah. He was out to lunch. He was watching the latest movie. He's not involved in patching Istio. And this is critical. Your platform engineers need to be empowered to unilaterally take action on security vulnerabilities in production. They cannot depend on your app devs to do that. Likewise, we can't really interrupt your app devs to do that. All right, we're going to take a minute to talk briefly about upgrade planning. We think there are two good ways to plan your upgrade in ambient mode, the channels and phases. In the channels mode, you always have two versions of Istio running, two minor versions of Istio running in your cluster. Uh, when you upgrade, when 120 rolls out, it'll go to rapid, and 119 will be stable. Then after three months, the next Istio release comes out, 121, rapid will go to 121, stable goes to 120. The advantages here are your app dev can actually choose between rapid and stable and get different features. If they want the latest greatest, they can ride on rapid and live dangerously. If they want something that just works and they don't have to think about it, they can stay on stable, and that's what they'll get by default. Also, by the time 120 gets into to stable, it's had a three-month bake time. So you're pretty confident in it at that point. On the flip side, it's pretty complicated. Uh, you've got a lot going on in your cluster, a lot of control planes to be spinning up. It might be a little bit much to explain to people. If you don't like that, you can do a phased approach. This has as many tags as you like. I'm only demoing two here. You get a new release, you start with rapid, then you go to regular, then you go to stable, probably like a day apart from one another, so that the stable state of your cluster is that all of those tags point to the same version of Istio, but you have an ordered upgrade. I'm going to upgrade this set of proxies, then this set of proxies, then this set, and you have control. You can also do phased strategies within channels, but that's even more complicated, and I'm not going to demo it today. So this is our app. We've got those three gateways that we talked about. You've already seen book info today, so I'm not going to go into it really deeply. But it's important to note that we have uh, everything on the stable revision or missing a tag altogether and therefore on the stable revision. Uh, this is the current state of our cluster, and we are now ready for our second demo. Uh, in this case, our app dev wants to get the latest, greatest features, like we talked about. They're on stable. They want to move to rapid. Let's see what that looks like. All right. Oh, we did get a handful of failed requests in our upgrade there. Uh, all the more reason not to push this to production. 
I'll still consider that four nines, though. It was just a blip. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was yeah. just we a blip. It. We got it. <laughs> Here's our entire pull request. It's two lines. We had no labels. Yeah. Now we're adding labels for rapid. That's it. Let's commit it. While he's committing that, I'd like to point out, like, this is all done through Git, right? Upgrading through Git. You get that audit trail. You get that who did what and when and at what time and who, um, who approved it and all that. You get that audit trail as well. So doing this declaratively has those other advantages as well. And, and Christian isn't talking up Argo CD enough. The yes. explanation that he just gave <laughs> took twice as long as the actual upgrade of our proxy. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's updated. We're now on rapid. And I'm not going to scroll around here long enough to find the version because we're running low on time. Uh, Locus. We look good. All right. Now we are, we've done this with our app dev. And our platform engineer, once again, completely uninvolved in the process. The app dev doesn't need to consult them. They can see what the rapid version points to. They can go to istio.io and see what features there that are available and say, that's what I want to use. That's it. All right. So here's what our tags look like now. We do have the reviews waypoint on tag rapid getting istio d 119.3. But we've got our last demo now. I know we're running short on time. We want to do a full minor version upgrade. This is the one that's tough. This is the one that everybody struggles with. And so we want to make sure that we prove that this thing works out. We're going to do it in two pull requests. The first one is a multi-part pull request. It's the largest you're going to see. And the second's a little bit smaller. Let's get started. Oh, uh, we're, sorry, I guess I'm going to illustrate it first and then do the demo. So what we're going to do, we're going to deploy the 120 beta control plane and move our tags up to Istio 119 and 120. That's all of both of those pull requests combined. We're going to do it in two separate steps here. All right. First step. Uh, we're taking, this is our CNI, 118.3 to 119. Oh, that should be five, but oh well. Uh, and then we, this little bug fix moves to 119.3, and we add our 120 control plane. Pretty simple. Still our largest uh, change so far, I think, at four lines. We'll merge that. Come back here and watch. And we're going to see 120 show up very soon here. Oh, uh, it showed up before I got there. <laughs> All right, 120 is spinning up. That's looking good. It's going to become healthy in just a moment. So we can move on to the next and final pull request of our demo with 10 seconds left on the clock. Yes. yes. Uh, Doing good. <laughs> Our default revision gets pointed to 119. Our stable revision gets pointed to 119. And our rapid re uh, revision gets pointed to 120. By the way, this is the beta. Again, don't do this at home, folks. Uh, it's a beta release of an alpha product. So that's even, that's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we're doing it, and we're going to see what happens. Let's go check out our gateways. Ooh, I got here before they actually spun up. So you can see the new pods starting, those blue boxes. And as they become available, the green boxes will become blue and start tearing down. And we can check out our reviews gateway, I think, is the one that should be on 120. Let's have a look. All right, there it is, 120 beta 0. We have gone ahead and done our minor upgrade. And we've got a little bit of hit on latency. We might even see a handful of failed requests. Oh, by the way, there's one extra demo somebody mentioned that I ought to do. And that is the, oh, no, this broke production demo. Here's how we unbreak production. We click revert, create. I know that there's probably too many clicks to this. We should talk to GitHub about GitOps needing fewer clicks for yeah. <laughs> rolling back, four whole clicks. All right, now we're going to start immediately rolling back, and we come here. There we go. Now we're rolling back our production off of those versions. Our production should get fixed about 10 seconds after we noticed an issue. So that's uh, how we can upgrade Istio ambient, ambient using Argo. I hope you can see how this gives you a lot more power than what we had in sidecar mode. And I hope I can see that I'm not currently on my slide deck. Uh, you can check out the repo with the link on the left. We would love to hear feedback from you all on our talk at the link on the right. And I don't know, I doubt we have time for questions. What do you think, Fasila, Zach? OK, we got time for one or two. Yep. That's 
All right, well, in that case, Zach and I are going to be around hallway track. Feel free to hit us up. Thank you all.